Okay, it looks like looks like everybody's dialing it back in. It's, it's, welcome everyone uh, to this outreach program conducted by the New York State Higher Education Services Corporation, uh, which is this uh, state college financial aid agency. We uh, administer all the uh, system program in you know all the financial aid program for New York State, including tuition assistance program TAP as well as many other um, programs that help student access and pay for post-secondary education. Uh, today, we are discussing the New York State DREAM Act. Uh, the DREAM Act uh, opens up the door to higher education to thousands of students providing access to the New York State um, Higher Education Services Program. And we are excited to, to welcome a wonderful uh, panel of experts from around the New York State and who will help us all become better informed about the New York State Dream Act and, and who is eligible. And again, I just want to apologize for all the issues that we were having tonight, but I, I hope that you really find the information helpful. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Linares so he can um, say a few words. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Anne. I got double introduction today just before the, everything crashed. So, I mean, uh, uh, there goes technology, uh, but uh, every, um, we're, we're learning. I, it's, I'm so excited to be part of the panel this evening. And, you know, as uh, it was said in the introduction, um, as an immigrant from the Caribbean, Dominican Republic, um, you know, I spend most of my life as professionally advocating for immigrants and also advocating for access to education uh, throughout. So, you know, from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, um, then, you know, the last 20 years I've been involved uh, in trying to help, uh, especially the undocumented, uh, access education and services and you know little did I know that when I got elected in 2010 to the state assembly my first bill was the DREAM Act uh, so I'm the original sponsor of the DREAM Act in 2011 um, and little did I know that uh, so many years later after that initial introduction uh, it would be approved and it would land uh, with me again as president of the Higher Education Services Corporation. So uh, it's, it's been a long road, but to see thousands of our young people who uh, have been dreaming of accessing higher education to access all the scholarship and grants that we have available, just like the rest of students uh, is, is a wonderful thing. And I want to say that from the very beginning, the two organizations that are joining us this evening, the Hispanic Federation and Make the Road, um, were with me in the very beginning with DREAMers uh, trying to get this uh, legislation approved and make a reality for thousands of DREAMers. And here they are tonight again, um, you know, every step of the way, many organizations and families have been working very hard. So I wanna welcome all of the dreamers and all of the advocates of dreamers and immigrants, uh, students uh, that are joining us this evening. And I wanna encourage everyone to share information that you're getting this evening uh, with other students. I wanna welcome all the parents on behalf of the governor who is highly supportive of giving access to higher education um, and supportive of education in general, uh, Governor Hoko, uh, and the entire team, uh, the Higher Education Services Corporation. Uh, so the team that's uh, presenting this evening uh, is, is ready to answer any questions you may have and take advantage of our website uh, and all that we have available for you. Uh, this is for you. Uh, and uh, I'm just happy to be here. And uh, I turn it back to you, Maria. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Felicitaciones a todos, and thank you, Tairi, 
Suleyma uh, for being there once again. Uh, it's really wonderful to be part of this effort. Wonderful, thank you so much. And, and it's important because you are one of those pioneers that uh, is really making uh, you know, this uh, come to, to a reality. And, and with that, I would like to ask our uh, panelists to introduce themselves and their organization, starting with Bianca. Hello, uh, my name is Bianca Sanders. Uh, my technical title, title at HESC is Assistant Director of Finance, but I've been working on the DREAM Act here at HESC since uh, April of uh, 2019 when Governor Cuomo passed the DREAM Act and um, I continue to work on the DREAM Act now um, and I uh, like I said I've been there since implementation and um, I am the project manager uh, as of today and um, I enjoy doing it and um, I, I believe we've helped thousands of dreamers uh, be able to now accomplish their dream of getting a comp uh, college education. Wonderful. Tidy. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Tidy Abreu and I'm the Director of Policy and Social Impact for the Hispanic Federation. I'm so proud to be able to represent the Federation today. Uh, you know, we've worked very closely um, with, with many advocates to make sure that this, um, this can be a reality. And you know, we're, we're just so, so happy to be able to continue supporting uh, the DREAM Act and to provide more information on this to ensure that you know, more, more students can take advantage of this and uh, fulfill their dreams for a post-secondary education. Thank you. Wonderful. And Suleyma. Thank you. A pleasure being here. Um, Suleyma and um, the youth organizer at Make the Road New York. And I'm also myself um, joined this fight since 2011 when um, I was going to college and myself it wasn't documented until DACA came in, in place, but being in the fight for a long time too. So happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and for your patience tonight. And um, we will start off with some questions for each of our panelists. And uh, if the audience has any question, please, uh, you can write them on the uh, comment session or you can wait for the Q&A session that we will have at the end. And um, I would like to start with Bianca. Can you provide some detail of, on the DREAM Act qualification and the financial award amount and scholarship timeframes? Uh, yes, I can. And um, I think we'll do that by showing uh, um, you know, graphics for, uh, for everybody who is uh, here. Um, so first of off, let's talk about how you qualify uh, for the DREAM Act. For the, so the first step in qualifying is uh, your citizenship status. Um, so the citizenship statuses that do qualify for the DREAM Act uh, first are um, either having a U visa or a T visa, uh, having temporary protected status, um, or uh, which is the vast amount of our DREAMers uh, being without lawful immigration status or uh, having DACA status um, or having uh, lawful immigration status, uh, which includes those who have permanent legal residence or a paroled refugee um, or whose parents live outside of uh, the country. Those are those who um, are of legal status and their parents live outside of the country. So those are those who have a residency issue. Um, and then we can continue on. Uh, we're going to talk about the educational um, aspect. Uh, that's the secondary qualification that's also needed. Um, and those um, are if you attended a New York, you have to have attended a New York State high school for two years and graduated um, or received uh, what was previously called a GED. Now it's called a task um, or um, be charged New York State uh, tuition at a uh, SUNY or CUNY for a reason other than uh, residency. So but you have to have those two, um, they have to, you know, be, you have to have both. You have to have a, um, your educational criteria and your immigration status. And that's your DREAM Act qualifying. Um, uh, that's your, when you're qualified for the DREAM Act and we can continue on. Um, and then also uh, in the qualifying, people kind of forget about this sometimes, you have to apply within five years um, of, of receiving your high school uh, diploma or your, uh, your GED. You have to apply within five years um, of completing that. 
Um, okay, so now we can talk about you know, the financial aid award amounts. Um, so for uh, New York State TAP, it's up to 56.65 a year, which actually in uh, uh, just last year went up $500 for the max award um, for those who are dependent on their parents. So that was a that was a nice bonus. So that's an additional $250 per term. Um, the Excelsior Scholarship is up to $5,500. To pay for your tuition at a SUNY or a CUNY college, uh, the ETA award, which are those students who go to private schools, are up to six thousand dollars for tuition to attend at a participating private university. And I think that's all that we have there. Um, and then when to apply. So I'm going to talk about some of the time frames um, for uh, our grants and our scholarships. So first, the DREAM Act. So the, the DREAM Act, when an applicant goes into the DREAM Act, that's open continuously. So you can go into the DREAM Act at any time. You can do your DREAM Act application. Um, and, then, uh, and then once you complete the DREAM Act application, then you can move on to TAP. Uh, we encourage all of our students to apply for TAP. And that's open from October 1 uh, through June 30th um, every year. So uh, many times there's simultaneous TAP applications. Um, right now, for example, we have both 21-22 academic year open and 22-23 academic year open. And those are basically 18 month applications. Then your Excelsior Scholarship, um, which opens um, in the spring, we anticipate that to be open in the next uh, maybe month or two, and that's going to be open for your fall, uh, for our fall applicants going to college in 22-23. Um, then we have STEM, which opens on October 1, and then we have various other programs also, and those uh, time frames vary, uh, but I want DREAMers to know that uh, it's not just TAP, Excelsior, uh, STEM that's open to them. There's also several other uh, scholarships that are also open uh, to dreamers as well. Um, they're very small, many very small ones, but those are uh, those are also open to them. And those uh, time frames they vary. They're usually short, forty-five day time frames, but those are are also open uh, as well as at various different times. But TAP and Excelsior, we all know those are those are the biggest ones, um, and STEM too. And I think that might be um, that might be it. Uh, but I also do want people to. Uh, know that the uh, Senator Jose Peralta Dream Act, it is not a grant, it is not a scholarship uh, uh, in itself. It is a pathway, it is an open door for those who, uh, primarily those who are undocumented or DACA. Uh, obviously there are exceptions uh, to the rule. There are other reasons why uh, uh, individuals might have to apply for the Dream Act uh, to be able to um, now be eligible for <clears throat> financial aid. It is not one specific, uh, award, it is not one specific uh, amount of money. Uh, the, the monies are open, it's an entitlement program, TAP is an entitlement, Excelsior is an entitlement. If you are eligible for the funding, uh, you go through the DREAM Act, you get qualified, and now all those fundings are open uh, to, to those who are undocumented. Uh, it's, it's kind of a myth that people think that it's always a certain little pot of money you know, for those who are undocumented. No, now those monies, just like those who are documented, the, the, uh, those monies are open for those now who are, who are undocumented. Wonderful, thank you mm -hmm. so much, Bianca, for that comprehensive um, you know, information about the, the, dream, uh, the DREAM Act. And uh, with that, I would like to continue asking questions to our panelists. And you know, we, our community-based partner have been instrumental in helping us um, reach the students and family who can benefit from the DREAM Act. They serve as the bridge between the community and our agency. And we are so, so grateful for that. And we know that there are some myth and misinformation out there about the DREAM Act. And um, they have helped us uh, get the fat out into the community. And, and we are so grateful for that. And beginning with Suleiman, has there been any continuing uh, hesitation with the, the immigrant, immigrant community to provide information uh, for the DREAM Act? And if, if so, what advice uh, would you offer to those who do not do have that those concerns? Thank you, uh, Maria, for like that question. It's a very important question, you know, to ask uh, every moment. I think like, and just because of the political environment that we live, right? Um, 
most of the times the uh, undocumented community has been under attack for many decades. And, and I think like that is the, like, um, the reflection that we look on is the fear in, in our communities, right? So uh, that being said, I think the first hesitation when we talk to students, right, is like, I'm undocumented, my parents are undocumented, I need to share all this information on paper and I need to send it via uh, email or electronically. And what if like this uh, information gets shared with other agencies? like eyes or anyone that will harm them. And, and you know, I think it's, it's obvious because like what we have been under through like so many attacks again, you know? So, you know, one of the recommendations as I like uh, make the road New York, we give them is like, your information is safe. Uh, that was one of the um, things that we fought at the, at, the, uh, at the state level. And we said to protect their data, right? They to protect their names, their addresses, everything that and that the information that they will provide, it will not be shared with anyone. So, so that's what we talk to them. We educate them, and we recommend them to, uh, when they submit the documentation, to um, just uh, cross mark their parents' information, their addresses, and we just want them to have uh, certain information visible, which is like your your name, your zip code, your, your state, your high school, um, and the address, those are the only things that we recommend them, right? But we tell them like any other information that you feel like it, um, that you don't wanna share, like your parents' information, just um, cross it out. And you know, this is something that we have continuously been doing since the implementation, but obviously there's a lot of um, um, fear in our communities that we gotta continue doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Tati, would you agree or would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I absolutely agree with what Sulima said. Um, you know, the hesitancy definitely stems from, you know, the fear of having, you know, them thinking that their, their information will be leaked, their information will be shared with federal authorities or other authorities that will misuse their information um, and put their, their families at risk of um, being deported. But that's not the case, right? Um, you know, when, when you apply for this program, your information is safe, your information is, is confidential and only used for your, um, your eligibility for the program. I think that given the current presidential administration that we've been under for over a year now, um, our families, um, our, our communities are not on alert as, as heightened as they, they may have been with the previous uh, presidential administration. And so I think, you know, our, 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 our communities have slightly, you know, a more sense of comfort um, and they don't feel like they're being headhunted. Um, I also think that, you know, getting information from trusted sources, you know, coming to uh, webinars like this one will help, you know, ease a lot of those questions and um, you can be sure that your information is safe. Wonderful. Yeah, Maria, awesome. I just want to add uh, one important um, piece of information that everyone listening should take to heart. And that is that on the federal law, state law, um, information that is shared uh, by students and their family uh, is strictly confidential and it's not to be shared. Uh, so, um, you know, that is extremely important for everyone to know. Uh, we at HEST, we are the recipient of information and it doesn't go anywhere from us. And we don't collect all the information. In fact, when we started the DREAM Act, uh, the first thing that would be used was the social security. Uh, we eliminated all the use of social security for students attending colleges and they were issued just numbers. So when you enter uh, college and when you apply, uh, we're no longer using social security. We're using a student number. Uh, the universities use student numbers. And so you don't know who is uh, documented or who is documented uh, as students 
uh, when you receive financial aid. So I want to emphasize that that is all information shared uh, with us is strictly confidential and not shared. Yeah, and that's great because I think you know when when you connect a social security with for for a student, and then a student doesn't have that number, then you know uh, colleges or administration or other can can determine that that person probably is undocumented. So I think that also put a layer of security to people uh, to student applying for financial aid and feeling secure that that information is not going to go nowhere. So thank you all for sharing that. And then I'm going to move on to Bianca. Uh, Bianca, what step have uh, has taken to address this concern? And I know that Dr. Linares addressed some of those, um, mm -hmm. but regarding the ap applicant uh, confidentiality. Um, yeah, I think that we've done, uh, you know, at people, at all the other panelists address many of the things uh, that we've done here at Hesk and obviously Dr. Linares as well with the student ID, which was a huge undertaking for Hesk and for the colleges. And we knew that it was uh, very important to, uh, to ensure uh, safety and security for our dreamers, um, uh, to ensure confidentiality, but also uh, those dreamers who are undocumented or DACA, they'll see when they go into the Dream Act application that um, that all the questions in regard to uh, you know their address or uh, SSN, um, unless they do have one, um, or any uh, you know personal and identifying information are not requested or asked. The the only thing in regards to um, address, like I believe Zulema had had said, is simply your zip code. Um, and then if any additional information is requested uh, from a dreamer that we might you know, need, maybe it's a transcript and we know that, you know, cause we, maybe it was missed or something. Um, and we needed to verify that you went to school for two years and graduated. Um, and cause I've done that when I've, uh, you know, worked with a dreamer and, um, and I'll say, make sure you redact your address. I mean, that's always number one um, and key to redact the, the address. So, um, and we're, we're always very careful about address and, um, you know, anything that will um, identify, you know, location or whereabouts or anything, you know, of a dreamer or their, in their families. We're also very careful about family information as well. Um, so certainly confidentiality was really when we were doing this at HESC was probably the number one thing besides making sure that they get their awards, mm -hmm. uh, like the number one thing. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and what is the time frame for people to apply? Um, I think that we went over a lot of uh, some of that, um, but I think the you know so, some of the key things is to is to make sure that they understand that they can go into the Dream Act at any time, and once they go into the Dream Act, they should always move forward um, in the application just to see what's open at the time. I mean, it never hurts to go into Dream, um, and if if they if they haven't done a Dream application. Uh, you know, recently they could, you know, they, they could, you know, fill it out, but most of the time they can move forward and you should always just see what's available. TAP again is 18 months. You're, you're probably always going to be able to do TAP, but just see if Excelsior is open to do it. Just see if, you know, maybe STEM are, are there's a lot of criteria for, but you should always just go in and see what's, what's open. And uh, the, the timeframes were on my, one of my previous slides, but uh, again, TAP, you should, you, you can, you can always just see if, hey, you know, maybe, you know, maybe TAP is open for, TAP will always open on October 1st. That's in law, TAP always opens on October 1st. We do have some leeway for some of the other uh, scholarships, um, but TAP you'll always see from October 1 to June 30th. Okay, and, and this question is for you, Bianca, so I'm not letting you up the hook yet. Okay, um, that's fine. <laughs> prior to the pandemic, I uh, has had received a number of questions regarding pulling back of the DREAM Act funding. Uh, could you clarify uh, the DREAM Act fund, how the uh, DREAM Act funding works? Uh, yes, that that's again, that was a, another myth. And I think just, just chatter, that was not true. Um, I think that I had mentioned before that, um, that the DREAM Act works uh, just like uh, funding for non-DREAMers. It is an entitlement um, if you apply for 
uh, TAP or Excelsior or any of the other, uh, some of our other uh, entitlement programs. Um, if you apply for it and you are eligible for it, um, you will receive it. I mean, keeping it up is a different story um, because you do have to be certified by the college. But if you initially apply for it and you're deemed eligible for it, you will receive it. It's an entitlement just like the non-dreamers have. There's no, uh, I mean, obviously if something catastrophic happens in the state and they have to reduce funding because of some reason, but it would be reduced on the non-dreamer side too. So that was just a myth. There's no reduction in quote unquote Dream Act funding. It's TAP all day long. It's Excelsior all day long for everybody now in New York state. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we continue, um, given that the government agency uh, to not typically offer a uh, full cost of attendance award that, um, what other opportunity can Dreamer pursue to help pay for college? And uh, this question is directed to Tidy and Suleyma. And Tidy, you can start first. Sure. So there are a couple of things that I would suggest. Um, for example, uh, there are institutional scholarships that um, students should be uh, looking into um, once you know they get accepted to uh, their university of choice. They can ask the financial aid department if there are institutional scholarships available. Um, sometimes colleges will automatically screen you know applicants for these scholarships. And so they might, you know, you might be automatically alerted along with your acceptance. But if you aren't, you know, you should ask about institutional scholarships. Um, you know, this is free money. Um, it's funding that you don't have to pay back uh, and that you receive, um, you know, perhaps based on your GPA. Um, and so it's, it's something that you need to ask about. The second thing I would suggest is looking for what I call outside scholarships. And so these are scholarships that um, a lot of affinity groups have scholarships that they, um, they provide. Um, for example, um, if you look at the Hispanic um, Association of Colleges and Universities, they have a full list of organizations on their website that provide you know, scholarships for students that identify as Latino, right? And it's it's the same for you if you identify as, you know, South Asian, for example. There are affinity groups that have uh, scholarships that they give to students. Um, and a lot of these aren't based on your citizenship status, right? That's not a prerequisite um, to receive these scholarships. So it's something that, um, you know, it's worth looking into, it's worth Googling. Um, if, if you go down the spiral in Google, you'll be able to find a lot of these. Selena? Yeah, no, thank you again for this amazing question. I think this is very important. And be, but before I share like uh, uh, more resources to, to you and parents and everyone, I just want to uh, emphasize that we should always uh, remind students not to apply to FASPA, right? There's a, a big misconception or miscommunication in schools that happen that they think like, um, just because they don't screen correctly students, they made them qualify to FASPA and that creates a problem for undocumented students. So just to be clear, do not apply to FASPA if you're undocumented, or even if you're DACA, you do not qualify for FASPA. Now, as for other resources like so we um, mentioned it, there are some scholarships, right, inside um, colleges. Hunter provides uh, scholarships for undocumented. Uh, Lehman and uh, Brooklyn uh, colleges uh, that are part of CUNY, they have uh, immigrant success centers that um, they can also go look uh, for resources in there. At Make the Road New York, we provide uh, a, a guides of a scholarship that they can apply throughout the whole country, right? Like the Dream US, this is a big scholarship and um, that a lot of young people are interested in, but like sometimes it requires you to have like, Tavi mentioned it again, uh, a GPA, right? And a lot of uh, like for giving essays. So I think like there are um, a lot of uh, scholarship, but at the same time, it's, uh, they're not a lot, with a lot of money. So sometimes it requires for young people to apply to multiple um, 
um, scholarships and sometimes end up being really competitive. Um, but at the same time, we do have an uh, amazing opportunities that um, the New York State offers like a ASAP and uh, ACE programs where undocumented school qualify for like MetroCard books and other resources that are that won't be available that wasn't available back in the day and now are so like this is really good programs that they should look into it and I make the road we definitely help them um so if any students like have any questions they should reach out to make the road wonderful thank you so much for that um um common application error and this question is going to be directed to um, Bianca we know that eligibility is determined and then um, our amount are calculated based on the responses to the application question. What do you find are the two area where there might be confusion in how to respond? Um, okay, so definitely uh, the first one is income uh, because as uh, most people probably know uh, those who are undocumented um, or DACA uh, in the app and don't have a social security number, which is a, a good number of our applicants um, when they're applying, they just basically have to put, um, for lack of a better way to say it, they just have to put a net taxable income in a field in the application. Um, so we have had a lot of issues in the application where the students, um, or it even could be um, the counselors who might be helping them are really not understanding what that net taxable income means because you know when you say taxable income, if the parents maybe are not really working a job that they're paying taxes on or they're just working under the table or what it might be, or uh, they're not quite sure, um, they'll put their their cousin who might live with them or they're putting themselves plus their uncle. We only want themselves, their parents, step parent, parent or adopted parents income in that field. And so many times and it, it, I've talked to students and they're like, oh, my goodness, this is such and such is or oh, this is such and such is or this is this income and it grossly overstates the income in the household. So I've had to work with them to change it. And again, grossly overstating your income then grossly understates your the award that you're eligible for. And so we don't wanna do that for the students. So what we did uh, this last year in the application was we definitely made it as, um, as 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 we as much as we possibly could, we put the uh, the explanation in the um, in the question that said only include your you know do not include aunts, uncles, anybody else besides you know your your direct you know parents, step parents, or adopted parents income into the field. Um, I hope that I really hope that uh, that has helped you know, um, and, and they understand that it's really what we would consider net taxable income or the take home income. We also put that in there, your take home income. Um, so that's one. And another one is your uh, dependency status. I've seen a lot of students not really understand that question on dependency status. So a lot of times they'll answer that they're an independent student um, and they're really not uh, because you can't just, you know, live with such and such and say that you're dependent because really you're under the care of your parents in New York State up until the age of 22, unless there's a reason that you're not. Um, and that could cause a student to get a lower award. Um, and I know most students are, you know, will think like, oh, I'm, de I'm independent, so I will get a higher award, but it's really the opposite. Independent students in New York State get lower awards than dependent students dependent depending on your your parental income um because then that threshold is only ten thousand dollars for an independent student and it's eighty thousand dollars for a dependent student and i know i just said a whole lot there uh for and i know it's probably very difficult to understand that but we do have a website that explains it and explains the difference between the income and the take home income and what the difference is between a dependent and an independent award and what that difference is. And I've had to explain it to a lot of students and they might live with their parent for six weeks or more. Um, and that automatically makes you a dependent student 
And if your parents just give you 750 or more in a year, that also makes you a dependent student. Uh, and financial aid counselors get this and I get it. And um, I'm hoping that people from Make the Road and Hispanic Federation get it because that does affect the students' awards a lot. Um, and, and certainly, hopefully our website is, is up to date. And uh, so we can you can go there and, and try to understand that for the students because they are making mistakes on that a lot and saying that they're independent when they are not. They truly are dependent students. So those are the two most common mistakes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Heidi and Suleyma, what um, other area do you see student and family struggle with um, on the application apart from, from reporting the income and the immigration status? Um, that's a good question. So I think the ones that uh, Bianca highlighted are the, the main ones, but um, there's like a tiny technical, um, you know, step that I found um, is, is confusing for a lot of students. Um, and it's the uploading of documents. Um, you know, if you upload um, more than one document, um, you know, you have to follow a certain step in order to do that. Um, you know, uploading PDFs versus uploading a Word document. Um, and that, you know, it, they're small things, um, but, you know, it, it doesn't allow you to complete the application unless you do it in that way. Um, and I know HESC has resources for how to, um, you know, how to fill out the application um, and we, at the Hispanic Federation, we also have it on our website. We have a very specific website for it, um, latinoedleaders.org, and, and I'll put it in the chat um, where you, you know, we walk you step by step through the application too. Great. Wonderful, Suleyma. Yeah, no, just uplifting uh, what uh, Bianca said. Like it, it's the main um, concern that we see in our in, in our base is like the income, right? That's the huge one. And I think like, that's not only with uh, parents and students, but unfortunately that also comes with uh, counselors and advisors because like they're not well prepared on understanding this, that they advise the, the, the students. So sometimes when they come to me, I'm like, no, actually it's this. So we uh, make the role, uh, one of our colleagues uh, did a chart that we started like sharing it with some of our, um, people in, in schools that we work with and with the people that we help, right? But like, um, you know, just simplifies and like saying, if you make more than 80, you will not qualify. Or if you, the more you make, the less your award will be. And um, just another question will come back and be like, well, both of my parents file taxes, but uh, only one of them claims me, right? So we said like, provide the, the person that you live with, right? Um, because sometimes that one parents are live separately from the mom or the dad or vice versa. So we just be like, report the taxes with the person that you live with, right? So I think like those are the advices that we do, but the main one is like the income. So I, I appreciate that you have updated the, the website. So thank you for that. No, thank you. And, you know, supporting family through through this process, we always said that um, the financial aid process is a very complex process for regular students. So I, I imagine that, you know, students that are undocumented are probably um, having <laughs> uh, more issue with um, completing those applications as well. And we hope that we can provide assistance as well. And um, Going on to the next question, um, common reason for losing uh, their word, right, Bianca? Uh, once a student, uh, someone has been notified that they are eligible for, for an award such as TAP, um, are they assured that they will receive their word or are there a common issue that might prevent them from receiving uh, their word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I think that this has obviously been some, you know, <sighs> communication issues with, you know, advisors at the college and uh, because obviously once they get the award notification from, uh, you know, from HESC or, uh, you know, from our vendor, they're very excited. They, you know, think it's, it's fine. They don't need to do anything else, but then comes the certification piece from, uh, from their college. And uh, so what they do have to do is, let's just take TAP for example, because that's the most common one. You do have to take 12 credits 
and the 12 credits need to be towards your major. Um, so many times what will happen is either an applicant will, you know, only take nine credits or, you know, they will take 12, but only six of them or something will be towards their major. And I'll, you know, I, many times I get emails from a student that I will have helped, you know, I'll, you know, maybe had helped them fill out their application and I don't know what's happening on the back end. And they'll say, what happened? And I, I'll say, and they'll say, I did take 12 credits, but now my school is saying I was decertified for TAP and, and it will be because either A, they didn't, you know, or they, if they did take 12, only six were towards their major. And if, or if they didn't take 12, they only took nine. And, so you do, it's uh, many times it's because they didn't meet the TAP certification requirement. And so that's definitely what we see a lot. And it's because of education. Many times these are, and I'm obviously Zulima and Tidy know this probably all too well from the, you know, the students that they work with, their first generation students going to school, their parents, you know, probably are, are you know, a second, you know, they're not speaking English. They don't, you know, so that what, how do these students know? And it seems like it's just very unfair that they are, you know, they're just, you know, thrown to the woods, you know what I mean? And the, the schools are not really taking the time, but at the same time, the schools don't have the, you know, many of the resources and, you know, I mean, and the pandemic didn't help either. So I really try my best to, you know, to tell the students the, as many as I can reach, make sure you're going to take all 12 of these credits, make sure they're going to be towards your major, make sure. And then also the same thing for Excelsior, because that's a big one. 15 have to, you have to make 15 or you have to make 30 in a 365 day period. Um, but at, I mean, I, I'm just going to go off a little bit. The great news is in the executive budget this year, uh, we did the students, if they cannot make the, uh, you know, we, we do have a proposal uh, for part-time TAP, which is why many of my students, many of the dreamers are not making, uh, you know, are getting decertified for TAP. So we will have part-time TAP, which you only have to take six credits and you don't have to have the, uh, the prerequisite of two semesters of full-time TAP in order to get TAP. Um, so if that does pass, that will be a huge bonus, not just for the dreamers, but the entire uh, population of, uh, of individuals to receive TAP, um, but it will help this population out greatly because I've seen so many decertified just for taking nine credits instead of 12 and, and then they're stuck with the bill for those nine credits and that's really hurt this population um, a lot. So the, those, are, those are some, that's probably one of the biggest things is just not meeting uh, the, the, the criteria that you do to get the award. Wonderful. That's such a great um, point, um, Bianca, because I think when we, uh, you know, Paola and I, when we do presentation, we're always talking to students and parents about making sure that they know what are the requirements, what is yes. it they need to do to mm -hmm. continue to receive this award, because I think they get so much support uh, now when they're uh, seniors and then, you know, their first year in college, uh, when they have to do the recertification, no one is there to help them. No one is there. And I, and I think, I hope that, you know, the more that we do um, event like this, we will talk about those issues that um, get them prepared. So when they sit down on to do the recertification for the second year, they're ready and able to do it and realize that, you know, you need to meet certain requirements and uh -huh. uh, hopefully that will help. And, and talking, continue to talk about communications. Um, what are some of the common communication concern that uh, you uh, heard from students and family regarding the DREAM Act? And this question is directed to Suleyma and, and Tidy. So Suleyma. Yeah, um, so one of like the communication pieces in here that we have been hearing from students is like, um, you know, whenever they complete their application is the follow through, right? It's like, no, they gotta be like, I think we gotta uh, also take in consideration that students are not used to checking their emails or their websites like that, that they end up like missing deadline sometimes. So they don't, like if they're missing a document, they don't submit it right on time. So I think like that's concerning to a lot of us, but at the same time it's like, 
when there's like more information um, like needed, they get frustrated right away, right? They get frustrated right away. There is no follow through and they give up on their application. And then they think like, oh yeah, I applied to the Dream Act and I am gonna get it. And then they said, they don't see that on the, on the tab, it says incomplete, right? Or that they didn't submit it completely. So I think like the communication is like, how do we make it more easier than it is? Like, I think like we always gotta remember that you know, we're, deal, we're dealing with technology more often now ever since the pandemic. So how we make more easy for, for young people and for the parents too, because some of the parents, as Bianca was mentioning, some of them don't speak English. Some of them don't know how to use a computer. So how we make these things easy for them so they can process and help their children. As uh, Bianca also mentioned, is some of them are like first generations going to college. And it's, it, it's hard because like our schools are are underfunded, like they don't have the resources and communities like make a uh, community organization like make the road don't don't often have the capacity to be like uh we would love to help everyone but at the same time like our offices are not open fully yet so you know we're doing the work here and there like supporting st students but like the concerns of the communication is like how do we make like um with the help of us like more services with multi languages for students. We have seen an increase of Arabic speakers where they also need help, right? So how do we continue like collaborating, helping and creating platforms that are easy to navigate for parents and students? Thank you. I think we, we second that and, and that's the purpose of why we are um, creating events such as this. Um, and Tidy, would you like to add anything to, to that question as well? So I echo everything Sulema said. Um, it's often that process of, um, you know, the, the application, uh, you know, going through. It's those checkpoints of, you know, you're missing, you're missing, um, you know, a piece of, of the application or you need to submit something else and missing those emails. And, you know, I've heard from students, um, you know, that a lot of our partners at the Federation work with uh, that, you know, they're like, I wish I can get a text that would sort of nudge me to, to you know, um, you know, go, go Go into my email and, and follow through. And so I think just, um, you know, um, if, if there's a way to, to further facilitate the process of the application so that it's easier um, for, for students and for parents especially, um, I think it would, it would be amazing and would really help our students. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we're always open to, to those suggestions because I think the goal that our agency has is to really provide and advertise all the program that we have so students can take advantage of them. And uh, with that, um, I would like to direct this question to Bianca. Uh, what communication aid does, um, does our agency has to offer people that might, may not uh, be aware of uh, all the services that we provide? And if there is anything new that uh, we are planning to, to do to help applicants? Um, well, I think as far as uh, communication aids, um, obviously we things like this, I think that these are, are perfect things to do for, you know, communications to get things out there uh, for, uh, for, for the dreamers. Um, I think that as often as we can, we put uh, um, things on the website. We also do newsletters. Uh, the, we have some dream newsletters. I think we'll probably get one out hopefully um, in the spring. Um, and those are kind of like blasts. Every time we open um, a new application, we definitely do newsletters. Um, but obviously it shouldn't stop there. We should always continue to get the communication out there and, and you know, and open the playing field up that much, um, you know, that much more. Um, and is there anything new planned uh, to help applicants? Um, we do have um, a change of information uh, platform or module planned. Um, uh, in the coming, you know, in, in, in the coming months for, for dreamers where they're just going to be able to do everything, all the changes um, themselves um, in the dream act, like to be able to change their college code, to be able to change, um, you know, any, any vital information on their application, they'll be able to do it themselves. It, it won't, it probably won't be things like income and sensitive data like that. 
um, but any, you know, change to like college, student ID things, those things like that, they'll be able to update themselves because right now, as again, as Zulema and Tidy probably know, um, and they've heard it, I'm sure from the, from the applicants themselves, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to get things done in the, in the DREAM Act because, um, you know, it was an application that was, you know, that was built, uh, you know, a little with, with some, you know, with some pain, um, but we got through it. But now, now the, uh, you know, things have to start to, to change to make it a little easier for them where, uh, you know, a dreamer can kind of go in um, and do some things themselves. So that's, these are the next steps uh, to make it a little bit easier for, for the dreamer to have a little bit more control themselves in the, in the application once they've, uh, you know, been approved and they are a solidified, uh, you know, awardee. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and as we are um, about to close, then uh, I will direct one question to all the panelists. And what would you say to the dreamer of today and tomorrow to encourage them to pursue a college degree? And we can start with Tidy. Sure. Oh, wow. That's such a great question. Mm -hmm. So I think that I would say, you know, a college degree opens up so many doors. It provides, you know, it provides economic mobility, which is what we came to this country for. It's what our families came to this country for. It's it was that opportunity to, you know, to have, um, you know, more success. And I think a college degree really helps you fulfill the promise of what this country provides. Uh, you know, so you know, give yourself that opportunity um, and, and apply for, you know, for these resources, um, apply for, for the DREAM Act and, um, you know, go get that college degree. Suleyma. Yeah, it definitely opens a lot of doors. Um, I will uh, advise everyone, like undocumented students, um, you know, I myself, uh, when I was in high school, never thought that uh, it was possible for me to go to high school, um, to college being undocumented, um, you know, and I, I never got benefit from, from the dream. I, it was a fight that I started, but I didn't get benefit. So now seeing that this was a, a door that we built because like back in the day, they closed us so many the uh, doors in, in our faces, right? But we built a, a door where we, we were able to connect with a lot of people that supported us. And, and thanks to that, this is like the result, the New Year's Day Dream Act and the fight of like so many people, including myself. So it's like, take advantage of the resources that you have and don't take it for granted. But at the same time, don't stop fighting because and at any moment things can get taken away. And, um, you know, we, we gotta still making paths for the future generations. So that being said, like, if you ever feel like, um, like there's an obstacle that you and your family are overwhelmed without not knowing how to do the application, reach out to your schools, you know, reach out to your schools, reach out to your community organizations, like Make the Road has um, the door. There's a bunch of like organizations that help undocumented students that guide them because a lot of us are working now in those organizations. And, and you know, it's just like, keep making the the building doors for for other or uh generations and, and yeah thank you thank you for sharing your your experience Elena. it's great um and bianca would you add anything to that question um yeah i mean i would just say to just continue the pursuit um i mean i know that you know for for many of the dreamers it you know, it 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 is going to seem difficult. It is going to be difficult. It is going to. It's not going to be you know an easy road all the time. Um, whether it be because of family issues or whether it is going to be because of financial issues or whether it's just going to be because you know your your classes are difficult or whatever it 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 might be. But in the end, you know, when you walk across that stage or you know be you know when you you know when you get that that job, you know it's all gonna be worth it. You know, at the end of the day, it's all gonna be worth it. And you're gonna look back and you're gonna say, wow, you know, I, I made it through. So just continue the pursuit and, and you're gonna see one day that it was, it was all really worth it. Wonderful. Dr. Linares, would you like to add anything to, 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 the, to this question as well?
I'm not sure if Dr. Linares is able to hear us, so I guess we will um, check. Dr. Linares just needs oh, to unmute. I, I, there you go. I just needed to unmute. <laughs> okay. I, I say my greatest inspiration, having been a teacher in elementary school, I was a professor in college, but all along an advocate for dreamers and for immigrants, uh, the greatest inspiration to me have been uh, from families that have been in New York and in the United States undocumented because they have faced so many, so many challenges and students that have been undocumented uh, in, in to get to get a high school degree, a high school diploma, uh, to even to get to that level has been so challenging that they have been my inspiration. So every student that I see get a high school uh, diploma, not only is now with the DREAM Act college uh, open to you uh, and for your family to see, you know, that you will now attend college and prepare for life, but there is no limit uh, for you to continue to go for the fourth uh, year degree for your master's and for your doctorate as I as I did. My parents are undocumented when they first came. So I say the sky is the limit. Um, you're not alone. You know, these organizations are there to support you. There are people all along the way uh, ready to step with you to make sure that you go through those doors and you realize your dreams. So uh, I, I, I'm inspired by dreamers. I've always been, and I continue to be inspired by them. Uh, they're an example of what really um, uh, greatness is, uh, and that they have been the one that uh, made this country the way it is and as great as it is. Wonderful, thank you so much. And now we're gonna move on to the Q&A um, session. And um, if I can get any of my colleagues to help me with the questions that we have. Um, uh, well, I can read the first one. It says, um, how long does it take to get um, an answer from TAP? <laughs> um, we, uh, we should be able to give you an answer uh, quickly, but if you um, are having issue, please feel free to uh, email us and, and we will definitely be able to, um, to find out what is the concern that you have with your TAP application. Uh, the other question that we have, and if anybody wants to add anything, Dr. Linares or Bianca or Anne um, regarding this question, No, I think it um, uh, regarding, uh, you know, what folks need to understand is just that they've provided all the information that has been requested for um, any of the applications and that sometimes a delay occurs because they've um, not, you know, completed um, the request for additional information or something like that. So just important to keep up with uh, your um, email that you receive so that you can stay on top of the status. Of, and and um, you know, a follow-up question to that is how long does the TAP grant get, um, I guess, how long does it take to get, uh, for the TAP grant to get to the college financial aid office after being accepted or after accepting their award? Mm. Um, oh. Yeah, so we have no one here, unfortunately, that's really skilled at, um, you know, that works in the processing area for this, but um, we do know that um, we certainly process uh, as quickly as possible. We understand how important it is to students and to the schools, um, but, um, uh, you know, there are certain certifications that need to be done at the school level. Um, as well as processing at the HESP level. So um, it's kind of hard to say without knowing the um, specific uh, details 
of the students. And, and can I can I speak on oh, that? Oh, certainly, that, Bianca. Yeah. Please, oh, because they're a um, because I'm a, I'm assuming this student applied through did this. I'm assuming this student applied through the Dream Act. Um, uh, I, I would have to. Um, they could. The student could contact me, um, and then I'll, I could find out because uh, I'm sure it, it's it's an issue that I would have to deal with directly as to why they, they have not gone to their school yet. The I have another, gone I've to got the another yet. question. Um, that is, do you apply to the DREAM Act during high school or do you need to be a high school graduate? Do you wanna take that senior, one, Bianca? Uh, yeah, yep. If, uh, um, if you're a senior in high school, uh, we encourage you to apply now and you do not have to have graduated. Our processors know and understand that you are a 2022 graduate and they'll process your DREAM Act and TAP application um, at this point and you will get your TAP award uh, now. So you can apply for, for schools and know what your estimated financial aid awards are. Thank you. Right. And another, another question, um, do you have to recertify your DREAM Act every year? Uh, no, you don't have to recertify your, your, your DREAM Act every year. I mean, it's fine if you do reapply for the DREAM Act. You're, it's not like you're going to be harmed by doing it. But once you apply for DREAM Act, if nothing has changed, like your citizenship status um, or any other pertinent information, but primarily your citizenship status, you shouldn't have to uh, reapply for, for DREAM again. Right. And we do have um, a couple of questions about um, um, the requirements for the scholarships um, that yes, um, each, each uh, grant or scholarship or New York State financial aid program does have its own eligibility requirements as well as requirements that must be met in order to retain the award. Um, at our website, hest.my.gov, we have, um, some uh, tons of information that we're hoping that um, folks um, take advantage of. Um, please visit um, our, the website and you'll see the list of the 28 plus um, financial aid programs that HESC administers uh, with information about each one of them. Um, and um, we have set up the information so that um, it's available from the uh, dreamer perspective as well. So please, we encourage you to visit um, and, uh, and check out all of the, the, um, the programs um, and the eligibility requirements there. I think that's about um, all the time that we have. the Q&A. Um, do you guys want to go quickly through them or... I know that Maria, I think, think that we've adjust, I think that we've met um, okay. we've reached uh, the time when we've we've hit most of the major topics. I think um, that we can answer some of the Q's and A's um, as well um, on our website um, following um, the publication of the video link. So we're okay. happy to do that as well. Wonderful. So yes, we will be, uh, you know, we will be able to find, you will be able to find a recording of uh, this discussion on our website, has.ny.gov. And if you have any question regarding how the dreams work, uh, you can also email us at the path at hesc.ny.gov until the end of the week. And we will post all those Q&A on our website in addition to the question that we have now, okay? And um, Bianca, do you have any final word that you would like to add? Um, I, I don't know, I mean, I guess, I think I just wanna say that, you know, I've been doing the, um, I am so sorry, my, my phone. Um, I've been doing the DREAM Act, you know, since uh, Governor Cuomo signed it in April. And I really do, do just wanna say, I have learned so much about um, dreamers and the stamina that dreamer had that dreamers have um, and the positivity that dreamers have and the determination that dreamers have and um, I really appreciate working with this population and um, it has been nothing but but a joy and it's been nothing but um, a positive experience for me and um, 
uh, you know, I, I'm really, really excited and I'm uh, excited to, to see what's to come and, and how many more dreamers we get to receive financial aid and graduate from college and continue to move forward and, um, and get college degrees. I think it's really awesome. <laughs> Maria, I just want to share that, um, you know, we, we have available uh, for students uh, in attending universities close to a billion dollars, a billion dollars available to students. Now through the DREAM Act, all dreamers have the same opportunity as all New Yorkers, all other students to apply for every single scholarship and grant program that we have. And I want every dreamer to take advantage of that and spread the word. I also want to thank you, Maria, for organizing this panel. Bianca, you're great. You're a champ. Uh, Suleyma and Tidy, thank you so much for being partners with us. You don't know how much that means, along with all the other nonprofits. And thank you, Anne, Paola, and Angela for being in the background, helping us uh, really have a successful uh, event. And I want to thank all the parents, all the dreamers, all the people that are committed to help dreamers realize, uh, you know, a higher education. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And, you know, we are, uh, we are there to serve students and families uh, at the state level and the sky is the limit. So uh, mm -hmm. spread the word and, um, you know, I'm very happy to be part of this effort still uh, going at it, uh, but it's the most exciting thing that I could uh, ever do. I'm very happy to be part of this panel as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Um, to give thank you to the it. translator too. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. to Anna, thank you so much. Um, you were a trooper to walk through the technical issue that we had initially. So I just hope that um, the information was useful. At the end of this panel, we will uh, you will have a survey. So we will appreciate if you can please um, take a minute to answer that. And with that, I will just want to wish all of you a good night and thank you for joining us. Good night.